uh, her introductory remarks. Good afternoon, Namaskar. His Excellency, Mr. Fumio Kishida, Honorable Prime Minister of Japan, Honorable External Affairs Minister of India, Dr. Jay Shankarji, Minister of State for IT, Skill Development and Entrepreneurship, Rajiv Chandrasekharji, Foreign Secretary Vinay Quatra, all dignitaries present here, I warmly welcome you to this lecture. As India's oldest think tank on foreign policy and international relations, it is a privilege for the Indian Council of World Affairs to host the Prime Minister of Japan, His Excellency Mr. Fumio Kishida, for the 41st Sapru House Lecture. I warmly welcome His Excellency. This is the second time in the past decade that ICWA has had the honor to host His Excellency Mr. Fumio Kishida. In January 2015, as the Foreign Minister of Japan, he delivered the 15th Sapru House Lecture on India-Japan Special Partnership for the Era of the Indo-Pacific. Since then, our special, strategic and global partnership has matured under the guidance of our two Prime Ministers and today, the relationship is one of trust and collaboration in a wide range of areas extending from political engagement, defense security and economic cooperation to science and technology, uh, education and culture and people-to-people -people contacts. India-Japan partnership has also greatly progressed in the context of the Indo-Pacific region that holds great economic and strategic importance. For India, the Indo-Pacific region, as stated by Prime Minister Modi, extending from the shores of Africa to those of the Americas, is a free, open and inclusive region, which, is, uh, which is, embraces all in the common objective of peace and prosperity, with ASEAN centrality and unity being important. Prime Minister Modi announced the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative IPOI, with its seven pillars to work collaboratively with other countries in pursuit of a safe, secure, and rule-based maritime domain. Japan is India's lead partner in the connectivity pillar of IPOI. Our partnership in the region also extends to working together within the Quad and in trilateral arrangements like the Resilient Supply Chain Initiative. The synergizing of Japan's free and open Indo-Pacific strategy and India's Actis policy and its Indo-Pacific vision has played a crucial role in bringing the two countries closer than ever. In the past three years, since 2020, the COVID pandemic and the geopolitical developments have resulted in global shocks which have caused widespread disruption, economic instability and significant loss of life. The current geopolitical landscape is witnessing heightened strategic uncertainty. The visit of Prime Minister Kashida comes at an opportune time, with Japan as the chair of G7 and India as the chair of G20 for this year. The two countries have a crucial and a pivotal role to play midst an increasingly glo uh, uh, global uncertain situation. India's presidency of G20 with the theme Vasudeva Kutumbakam, One Earth, One Family and One Future, will also seek to bring attention to the issues of the Global South. Moreover, as members of G4, India and Japan have a common interest in reformed multilateralism so that the UN bodies, including the UN Security Council, is updated to reflect contemporary realities. Strong ties between India and Japan have benefited not only our two countries, but contributed positively to the wider Indo-Pacific region and the global agendas. With these words, may I now invite His Excellency, uh, uh, Prime Minister Fumio Kishida, 
to deliver the 41st Sapro House Lecture. Please welcome Prime Minister Kashida. Dr. Jai Shankar, External Affairs Minister of India, Ambassador Singh, Director General of ICWA, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I cannot help but feel a sense of destiny that I'm here in India to speak about my vision for a free and open Indo Pacific. As you all know, a free and open Indo-Pacific, or FOIP, was proposed by my esteemed friend, former Prime Minister Abe Shinzo. In 2007, former Prime Minister Abe, right at this place, made a speech that linked the Pacific and the Indian Ocean for the very first time. India is the place where FOIP came into being. I also traveled here in 2015 as then Minister for Foreign Affairs and spoke at an event hosted by the same ICWA as today. I spoke about how Japan and India should jointly lead the region and the world in the era of the Indo-Pacific. In 2016, former Prime Minister Abe delivered a vision called Free and Open Indo-Pacific. Seven years since then, the international community has seen major events that could be described as paradigm shifts, including the COVID-19 pandemic and Russia's aggression against Ukraine. I would like to speak today about how Japan further develops the vision and how it makes efforts for the future of the Indo-Pacific. I have two points to deliver to you today as follows. First, why is it necessary to develop FOIP now? At a time when the international community is at a history's turning point, I would like to clarify the concept of FOIP once again to propose a guiding perspective to be shared by the international community, which, if left unchecked, could drift towards division and confrontation. Second, Japan will expand cooperation for FOIP. Russia's aggression against Ukraine oblige us to face the most fundamental challenge, defending peace. Various challenges related to global commons, such as climate and the environment, global health and cyberspace, have become more serious. I will incorporate these new elements of addressing peace and the global commons related issues into FOIP. Also, I will take further measures in areas such as connectivity and freedom of the seas that have been the focus of FOIP thus far. As I said to you before, international community is faced at a history's turning point. In international community, there is a big balance of power changes that occurring, shifting dramatically. 
And this area is one of the area. In my speech in the U.S. in January, I stated that as the so-called global south grows and the world becomes more diverse, we need to have a good understanding of their historical and cultural background and that the means of sharing responsibility for global governance will become an increasingly important issue. The international community has entered an era in which cooperation and division are intricately intertwined. We are seeing an entanglement of different issues, including geopolitical competition, global challenges such as climate change and the impact of scientific and technological developments on nations, societies, and individuals. This situation could be described as a compound crisis in a war like this. The more vulnerable the nation, the greater the sacrifices, and the more they are at the mercy of different issues. One characteristic of this turning point is a lack of uh, guiding perspective that is acceptable to all about what the international order should be. This was clearly demonstrated by the considerable discrepancies in the attitudes across various countries toward Russia's aggression against Ukraine. I think this is an indication that a strong centrifugal force is working within the international community at the most basic level of a perspective. Thus, with the changing paradigm in international relations and in the current situation where there is no consensus on what should be the underlying perspective for the next era, FOIP is a vision that is, in fact, gaining in relevance. In this sense, FOIP was a visionary concept. In particular, the concept of FOIP has been flexible in evolving in a way that embraces various voices, along with the growing support and endorsement from the international community. I believe that this vision, nurtured by the voices of different countries, and which can be characterized as our FOIP, is becoming more important than ever toward the goal of leading the international community in the direction of cooperation rather than division and confrontation. Even at this turning point, the fundamental concept of FOIP remains the same. It is simple. We will enhance the connectivity of the Indo-Pacific region, foster the region into a place that values freedom, the rule of law, free from force or coercion, and make it prosperous. With this backdrop, we should reaffirm and share the understanding that at the root of the concept of FOIP is defending freedom and the rule of law. In other words, vulnerable countries are in greatest need of law and a state in which the principles of the UN Charter, such as respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity, the personal peaceful resolution of disputes and the non-use of force, are upheld. Is the important premise on which freedom is enjoyed in the international community. Another equally important principle of FOIP is respect for diversity, inclusiveness, and openness. In other words, we do not exclude anyone, we do not create camps, and we do not impose values. Based on these principles, the approach we should take going forward is rulemaking through dialogue that respect the historical and cultural diversity of each country and equal partnership amongst the nations. I believe these are the new core elements of FOIP. There are various views on what the international order should be, such as unipolar, bipolar, or multipolar. 
but it is not about poles of a single or multiple major powers. I believe that we should aim for a world where diverse nations coexist and prosper together under the rule of law without falling into geopolitical competition. Furthermore, it is important to adopt an approach focusing on people being not limited to national level. I believe that the survival, welfare, and life with dignity of individual people are a goal that should be pursued anywhere in the world. A nation prospers when its people prosper. Japan will carry out diplomacy to create conditions necessary to achieve this goal. Our FOIP needs to be undertaken together with various countries and stakeholders. Japan will strengthen coordination with the U.S., Australia, ROK, Canada, Europe, and elsewhere. Of course, India is indispensable. We will expand the networks amongst countries that share the vision, including ASEAN and the Pacific Island countries, the Middle East, Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean and direct efforts in the spirit of co-creation. That said, we newly set forth the four pillars of cooperation for FOIP that are suited for the history's turning point we face. The first pillar is the principles for peace and rules for prosperity, which is the backbone of FOIP. The people who suffer the most from the erosion of the rule of law in the international community are vulnerable countries and people in vulnerable environment. My question is this. Can we not collectively reaffirm and promote the minimum basic principles that the international community should uphold? And by doing so, can we not build the peace of the international community, which can easily collapse if not attended to? These principles include respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity and opposition to unilateral changes to the status quo by force. These principles appointed to in the UN Charter should be adhered to in every corner of the world. On this occasion, I reiterate that Japan strongly condemns Russia's aggression against Ukraine and will never recognize it. Prime Minister Modi, too, expressed to President Putin that today's era is not of war. Japan opposes any unilateral changes to the status quo by force anywhere in the world. Moreover, Japan has extended a helping hand to any country in need. For example, over the past two decades, it has supported the Philippines in its fight against the poverty and terrorism and has helped achieve peace in the Mindanao region. It will continue to proactively support the efforts of each country to build peace and reconstruct itself, including providing assistances to you can based on the ten nets of dialogue and cooperation, and Japan will also provide the support that caters to the needs of women, taking in the pers perspective of women, peace, and security, creating a free, fair, and just economic order that does not foster division is also essential. While maintaining the WTO rules as a foundation, we will promote further efforts such as the CPTPP with countries that have the will and ability to pursue a higher level of liberalization. Further to the degree of liberalization, 
the renunciation of unilateral changes to the status quo by force and of economic coercion is also an essential condition for building economic relations based on trust. Furthermore, Japan has not forgotten to take vulnerable countries into consideration. Bangladesh, India's neighbor, will soon graduate from being classified as a least developed country. And we have already launched the joint study group on the possibility of an economic partnership agreement with Bangladesh. This also reflects the important FOIP principle of excluding no one. Rulemaking to prevent opaque and unfair development finance is necessary for nations to grow autonomously and sustainably. The failure of a nation has enormous impact on the lives of ordinary people. Japan will promote the implementation of the G20 principles for quality infrastructure investment. It is essential that Sri Lanka state restructuring advances in a fair and transparent manner. Japan will collaborate closely with India and contribute to stability in the South Asian region. There are many excellent Japanese companies that can provide quality infrastructure. We will encourage their overseas operations that excel in providing quality infrastructure, thereby revitalizing both local economies and Japan's economy. The second pillar is addressing challenges in an Indo-Pacific way, which is a new focus of cooperation for FOIP. In this era, the importance of our global commons, including climate and the environment, global health and cyberspace, is dramatically increasing. We will address various challenges related to them in a realistic and practical Indo-Pacific way and expand the cooperation for FOIP, thereby enhancing the resilience and sustainability of each society and achieving an equal partnership among autonomous nations. On climate change, Japan will lead a clean market and cooperation in innovation in order to realize the global green transformation, GX. It will promote the Asia Zero Emission Community concept as a regional platform which aims for achieving both decarbonization and economic growth. It will also take advantage of ODA and provide support, including for the introduction of renewable energy in island countries. Regarding food, Russia's aggression against Ukraine has caused the food prices to rise, and the stable supply of food around the world is a matter of emergency. We recently decided to provide 50 million U.S. dollars in emergency food aid to support vulnerable countries in Asia, the Middle East, and Africa, as well as corn seeds and other assistances to support vulnerable farmers in Ukraine. In addition, Japan has proactively worked on the ASEAN Plus 3 Rice Reserve Initiative. It will continue to develop this visionary mechanism for countries to pool their stockpiles in the event of an emergency. Witnessing how COVID-19 has exacerbated the division and disparity in the international community, we are keenly aware of the necessity to respond to global health issues worldwide. Japan remains committed to achieving universal health coverage. Japan continues to support the ASEAN Center for Public Health Emergencies and Emerging Diseases to become the core of infectious disease control in the Southeast Asian region. 
The scale and frequency of disasters are becoming more serious due to the effects of climate change and others. To help countries build resilient societies, both in terms of disaster prevention and recovery, Japan will harness its expertise and technology to provide support, including for improving disaster prevention and response capacity. The proliferation of disinformation is a common challenge in all countries that hinders people's uh, political self-determination and threatens the autonomy of nations. With a view to ensuring a free and fair cyberspace, we will hold a workshop or other events this year to expand the knowledge throughout the region on countermeasures against uh, disinformation. The third pillar is a multi-layered connectivity, which is a core element of cooperation for FOIP. No matter how times many may change, our need for economic growth will remain in order to achieve growth. Countries need to stay connected in various aspects. However, the kind of connection that relies solely on one country it could be a breeding ground for political vulnerability. By connecting, we aim for increasing each country's options, help them overcome their vulnerabilities, and pursue economic growth in a way that benefits everyone. Here, I would like to mention three important regions. One is Southeast Asia. The ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific AOIP and FOIP are visions that resonate with each other. Japan will make a new contribution of 100 million U.S. dollars to the Japan ASEAN Integration Fund, being mindful of the ASEAN Japan Commemorative Summit to be held in Tokyo in December. We will also renew by December uh, the comprehensive Japan ASEAN Connectivity Initiative, uh, which promotes efforts uh, to strengthen both hard and soft connectivity. The next horizon is South Asia, including India. The Northeast India, which is uh, surrounded by land, uh, still has unexploited economic potential. Viewing Bangladesh and other areas to the south as a single economic zone, we will promote the Bay of Bengal, Northeast India industrial value chain concept in cooperation with India and Bangladesh uh, to foster uh, the growth of the entire region. And then uh, the Pacific Islands region. The waters that connect Japan and the Pacific Island countries have no borders. The Pacific Islands region is exposed to many challenges such as rising sea levels due to climate change, infectious diseases such as COVID-19 and natural disasters such as volcanic eruptions. The new Palau International Airport Terminal project supported by Japan is a true example of connectivity in that it has not only vitalized the tourism in the economic sense, but also facilitated the transportation of COVID-19 relief supplies. The undersea cable that is being supported by Japan, the US, and Australia will also play an important role in overcoming vulnerabilities. We will further set up our efforts correction. We will further step up our efforts in preparation for the Pacific Islands leaders meeting which Japan will host next year. Of course, countries in the Middle East, Africa, Latin America and other regions are also important partners in realizing FOIP and we will advance cooperation in various areas. I would like to add to FOIP an approach focusing on people being not limited to national level. We will strengthen the knowledge connectivity that focusing on people helps human resource development, creates new innovations, and underpins the vitality of the region. We will strengthen various exchange programs such as Genesis and the Asia Kakehashi Project and connect the youth who will lead the next generation.
Next year, if all goes well, a branch of the University of Tsukuba will open in Malaysia. We will support Japanese universities' expansion overseas and connect knowledge and experience. Recently, ICU services have been provided to ICUs in developing countries remotely by medical experts in Japan. We support such efforts and connect laboratories and the field. In addition, we will connect entrepreneurs and investors through supporting startups in Africa and the Japan ASEAN Women Empowerment Fund. In a post COVID 19 world, digital connectivity is also increasingly vital. We will promote reliable digital technology, including Open RAN and develop information infrastructure, including submarine cable laying projects. We will also cooperate in the materialization of smart cities utilizing digital technology. We believe that there is a great potential to utilize Japanese technology and India's strength in the IT field, as well as to provide support for infrastructure development through Japanese ODA. The fourth pillar is extending efforts for security and safe use of the sea to the air. FOIB has consistently focused on the sea. The oceans are becoming more important and significant. As we have seen with the aggression against Ukraine, major geopolitical shifts are taking place at the heart of the vast Eurasian continent. One could say it is a tragedy. I want to free the oceans from such geopolitical risks. There is an imperative to protect and nurture the public ocean bounty that we all share. Also, we will work on issues in entire public domain, including ensuring safe and stable use of the air. In order to protect the oceans from various risks, I would like to once again call for the three principles of the rule of law at sea that Japan has long advocated, i.e., one, a state should make and clarify their claims based on international law. Second, states should not use force or coercion in trying to drive their claims. And number three, states should seek to settle disputes by peaceful means. This year, Japan officially adopted the position that it is permissible to preserve the existing baselines and maritime zones, notwithstanding the regression of coastlines caused by climate change. The law is there to protect the weak. The position mentioned above by way of the three principles, protects the oceans of the islands region from risks. Further, to protect the free oceans, we will support the strengthening of maritime law enforcement capabilities of each country through human resource development, strengthening cooperation amongst Coast Guard agencies, and joint training with the Coast Guards of other countries, especially damages caused by illegal fishing is becoming increasingly serious, including in the Pacific Islands region. Japan is no exception. We will strengthen our efforts to combat so-called IUU fishing. We will also expand our efforts for maritime security. My administration has been working on the joint training between the self-defense forces and each country's armed forces and the development of legal infrastructure such as the RAA and AXA. The RAAs with Australia and the United Kingdom have been submitted to the current session of the Japanese Diet, while AXA with India is already in operation. A new framework for grant aid to armed forces and other related organizations of like-minded countries has also been established. We look forward to cooperating with India in the future, too. The Maritime Self-Defense Forces is regional maritime peace and stability.
We will promote joint training with India and the United States and goodwill training with ASEAN countries and Pacific Island countries. In addition, it is important to ensure the safe and stable use of the air and to enhance the maritime domain awareness from the air. In order to improve the capacity for grasping situation of the air, we will proactively promote transfer of warning and control radars and human resource development and exchange. It is also important to take advantage of satellites for the maritime domain awareness and we will promote human resource development and information sharing. Further, we will enhance cooperation amongst aviation authorities to address new technologies, including drones. I've spoken about the four pillars of cooperation for FOIP. In expanding cooperation for FOIP, the key will be to implement an optimal combination of various methods. We will further strengthen diplomatic efforts, including by expanding our ODA in various forms, strategically, strategically, while engaging in a strategic use of it. Uh, from this viewpoint, we will revise uh, the Development Cooperation Charter and set forth guidelines for Japan's ODA for the next 10 years. In this context, we will strengthen coordination amongst agencies that handle OEDA and other official flows and launch an offer type cooperation which will enable us to develop and propose attractive plans tailored to development demands while taking advantage of Japan's strengths. We will also introduce a new framework for private capital mobilization type grant aid that will attract investments. This is a new menu to support startups by motivated young people in each country. It will help mobilize private capital which seeks to contribute to economic and social challenges. This is a new attempt to generate synergy effects of public and private funds and Japan will work together with regional partners that support this idea. In terms of mobilizing private capital, a draft amendment to the JBIC law is under diet deliberation by adding foreign companies that support Japanese companies' supply chains to the loan portfolio and by making it possible to invest in startups with overseas operations, it will encourage private companies to expand in growth areas such as digital and decarbonization while ensuring economic security. Through these efforts and with the public and private sectors working in tandem, we will respond robustly to the needs of each country. Japan will mobilize a total of more than $75 billion U.S. dollars in public and private funds through private investments, yen loans and other means in the Indo-Pacific region by 2030 in infrastructure, for which there are major demands from each country. Japan will grow together with other countries. Up to this point, I have described Japan's plan to develop a free and open Indo-Pacific. To achieve this, India is an indispensable partner. I believe that Japan and India are in an extremely unique position in the current international relations and further more in the history of the world. India is the largest democracy in the world. I have always viewed with great respect at the way such a huge and diverse country as India has developed a democracy. Japan, for its part, was the first country in Asia to achieve the modernization and embrace democracy. It is fair to say that both countries are naturally receptive to and fully committed to the idea of electing governments through general elections and deciding policies through public debate. Even during the COVID-19 pandemic, 
there were no voices at all in either Japan or India that said that a totalitarian system of governance would be better. At the same time, both Japan and India have unique historical backgrounds. The people of the two countries humbly acknowledge that there are diverse values, cultures and histories on this planet and that fully understanding them is not an easy task. We are the kind of people who understand intuitively that the best way forward is to respect the other party and cooperate through dialogue. It follows that Japan and India have a great responsibility for maintaining and strengthening a free and open international order based on the rule of law. This year, as Japan hosts the G7 presidency and India hosts the G20 presidency, my hope is that through working together with ASEAN and other many countries, we will bring about peace and prosperity to the international community which faces a time of challenges. The vision for achieving this is FOIP, a free and open Indo-Pacific based on the rule of law. I believe that this region will be a place where freedom and the rule of law are valued free from force or coercion. Japan will spare no efforts to cooperate with India for the success of the G20. I am looking forward to welcoming Prime Minister Modi to Hiroshima in May and visiting India again in September. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Excellency. It is now my pleasure to request Mr. Vinay Quatra. Foreign Secretary, Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India, to give the vote of thanks. Ministers, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. His Excellency Prime Minister Kishida, on behalf of all of us in India, I once again welcome and thank you for your visit to India. Thank you for choosing to deliver the 41st Sapru House Lecture today. Thank you also for so clearly and candidly articulating your vision for the Indo-Pacific, as also your vision of where you see Japan and India-Japan partnership in the evolving geopolitical context. India-Japan special strategic and global partnership built on shared values and interests has evolved today to encompass practically all areas of human economic endeavor. We are today seeing greater and greater convergence on regional and global issues of significance with India and Japan holding chairs of two key international groupings, India for G20 and Japan for G7, we have indeed found a unique opportunity to discuss our respective and shared priorities. The fact that you chose to deliver the speech in India is significant, not just for our two countries, but it indeed sends an important message to the entire region and the world. It speaks volumes about the strength of India-Japan strategic relations. We in India see our ties with Japan as crucial for fostering peace, prosperity and stability in the Indo-Pacific. Strong partnership with Japan is the cornerstone of India's Act East policy and a centerpiece of our vision in the Indo-Pacific. We hope to continue deepening our existing ties and find 
new areas of cooperation and partnership with Japan under Japan's renewed vision of the Indo-Pacific. With these words, Excellency, I thank you again for your visionary and insightful lecture today. Best wishes to you for the rest of your stay in India and for your return to Japan. And we look forward to welcoming you again in India in September this year. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. With this, we come to the end of the program. Do you know why I like to work in DLF Cybercity Gurugram? The future arrives faster here and so do I. I don't know about other roads, but the one I take to work doesn't have bumper to bumper traffic or loud horn music. This road is wide open for me. It's my expressway to the future. DLF Cyber City Gurugram. The future works here. To take it from here, I'd like to invite on stage our session's moderator, Rajdeep Sardesai, consulting editor in their today television. Hello and welcome uh, once again to the India Today Conclave. Few, if any, constitutional posts at the moment in the country carry the weight of public expectations and the microscope of public scrutiny as much as that of the Chief Justice of India and, dare one say, the Supreme Court itself. Not a day passes when the Apex Court doesn't make the headlines in some form or the other. So how do those 
who have worn what some might argue is now a crown of thorns see the role of the Supreme Court and the Chief Justice of India in particular. Today we'll be listening to three Chief Justices of India, uh, two former recent Chief Justices and the current Chief Justice in the course of this day. Please therefore welcome our first guest, Justice S.A. Bobde, Chief Justice of India from November 2019 to April 2021. Justice Bobde, welcome uh, to the India Today Conclave. Uh, am I right in suggesting that the Chief Justice's post today is a crown of thorns, constantly under scrutiny and therefore seemingly under immense pressure as well? Poked by the media. I uh, see. It, it is uh, it is a difficult uh, place to be in, the Chief Justice of India. But uh, and it is a heavy responsibility. There are there's too much competition for uh, the court's years, and uh, obviously everybody wants to win his case. But uh, I'm saying this frankly, without any disrespect, the problems uh, really arise from the somewhat irresponsible comments uh, judges have to face. And, uh, and the Chief Justice is always answerable. Anything that happens in the court is the Chief Justice who is responsible. No, you seem to be almost suggesting that Bechara Chief Justice. No, not at that, all. You know, look I'm at not, I was just telling you, I was just carrying forward your analogy of thorns. Yes. I said the post itself, it, there's no thorns on the post. Uh, those thorns are what you get from uh, the onlookers. Okay. Uh, the onlookers will probably turn around and say that the fact is many judgments in this country at the moment are tangled in political wars. You were, for example, part of the Ayodhya judgment. And the nature of the case, the kind of politics that had swirled around Ayodhya for decades meant inevitably, whatever judgment you delivered, there was going to be some kind of a political fallout to it. That's so in every case. But is that part of the problem? That because the, the Supreme Court today increasingly finds itself tangled in taking up these political cases, whether it is Rafael, yeah. whether it is... Uh, uh, the Ayodhya judgment, because these cases come eventually to the Supreme Court, the court almost inevitably and the Chief Justice inevitably finds himself caught in a political battle. Well, uh, I would like to say that the word label political can be attached to anything. I see nothing political about the Ayodhya case. The case what we heard. There is probably nothing political about Rafael. It was a defense deal. Mm -hmm. Ayodhya was an issue about whether Lord Ram, in, amongst other things, Lord Ram was born in that place, etc., etc., etc. So I don't see, and the case has been going on since, the problem has been going on since pre-independence times. What is political about it, except that politicians talk about it? Or, or some might want to derive political mileage from a controversy. We are not involved in politics as, as courts. We decide a case that comes up before us, brought to us by parties who have something to say and uh, who have a claim, and we uh, adjudicate that claim. What is politics in it? So you didn't feel mm. extra pressure while you all were hearing and eventually delivering the judgment in a case like Ayodhya? No. Uh, possibly a greater sense of, uh, possibly some sense of anxiety on what it might, uh, what effect it might have on the body politics to some extent, but not the political kind. The reason I'm saying this, sir, is that there is a huge question mark over whether the Supreme Court is truly independent today. And that includes, 
truly independent independent of what independent of executive interference or executive pressures uh, i quote a senior supreme court advocate dushyant dave he is also headed the supreme court bar association said judges are scared of the modi government and reluctant to rock the boat well i don't think i should respond to his views <laughs> i mean they entitled to his views but i do not see any executive interference in the judicial process mm -hmm. i did not experience any you could ask you have invited uh, other other colleagues of mine today you could ask them you see the way the executive can interfere is by having benches suitable to it in each case and that doesn't happen the benches the roster is prepared by the chief justice of india independent of any pressures चैनल पे टाटा आईपीएल आओ तुम्हें जियो सिनेमा पे असली आईपीएल दिखाए अरे भैया इतने पास गले लगोगे क्या प्रणाम पूरे भैया अब खेलने हम हाँ खेलो खेलो अब डिजिटल इंडिया देखेगा डिजिटल टाटा आईपीएल सिर्फ जियो सिनेमा पे किसी भी स्क्रीन पे किसी भी मोबाइल नेटवर्क पे बिल्कुल फ्री International Women's Day. Let's shine the spotlight on all sheroes around us. Log on to www.hershey.co.in to send a personalized message celebrating your shero. But that itself has become contentious over times. So you know how four judges. staged a few years ago a remarkable press conference an unprecedented press conference yeah. where they questioned the manner in which uh, allegedly bench fixing might have been taking place that uh, press conference i am i am not aware of the allegations of bench fixing though there were there was something about the preparation of rosters yeah questioning over the of the role of the supreme yeah, court chief justice that, as master of the that roster that to my mind is the one of the most unfortunate events in the history of the supreme court of india and uh, i tried my best to see that it doesn't happen and thereafter i am saying this uh, because some magazine has already written about my role there and i did try to bring about uh, a peace between the opposing points of view mm -hmm. i succeeded party didn't succeed but it's an unfortunate event i don't want to okay. uh, i don't support 
I wouldn't have done it myself. You believe it's an unfortunate, you're saying uh, something important. You're be you believe it's an event that should have never happened. It's an unfortunate event. You don't subscribe to the way it happened. Let me give you examples. Since you say you don't want to respond to what an individual advocate's opinion is. Habeas corpus petitions of those who were arrested, for example, in Kashmir, after the setting aside of Article 370, they were kept pending for months. You didn't touch the electoral bonds issue, sir, which again is politically a hot potato. All of this is being interpreted to see, to suggest that the court and the Chief Justice's office unwilling to take on the government. People were for months in jail, sir, under the Public Safety Act in Jammu and Kashmir, habeas corpus petitions filed, and the Supreme Court of India does not see urgency in that matter? I don't think they were kept pending deliberately as you people see it, or anybody else sees it. And one thing I must tell you in this context, I believe, and it is said to be a law of how the human mind works, and that law is, that a suspicious person always finds what he's looking for. It is true in the domestic front, it is true in politics, it is true in the executive, it is true in the media, it is true everywhere. You always find what you're looking for. I'm only giving you a reality, sir. No, Hundreds that, of innocent no, people possibly were in jail for months. Habeas I corpus was is the basic right first that I have all, under the Constitution. First of all, it was during the pandemic. Yes. It was during the pandemic. It was difficult to get matters heard. I can tell you, I am not, I was not ready for this question. I can tell you hundreds of cases where the courts wanted, uh, asked parties, would you like to give a, uh, would you like to hear? And uh, parties said, no, we cannot appear. Advocates said they cannot appear. And it happened that there was something about the CAA matters were also pending then. That's right. And they wanted those to be heard. Now that involves entering, uh, allowing five to six hundred advocates uh, to enter the courts. That was not possible. And some of them said, no, we want our matters tagged. We will not get them untagged. But frankly, I would have liked to answer this question with statistics, which I am not ready for. Okay. Uh, you were Chief Justice also, sir, during the contentious, I'll come to COVID later, during the contentious farmer agitation. And you stayed the implementation of farm laws until further orders. Now, traditionally, the Supreme Court, sir, has been very wary of passing interim orders that stay laws passed by Parliament. And yet you did so. Yes, I did. Were you aware again that, like it or not, you were stepping into a political minefield? You see, the courts seem to be stepping into a political minefield. The media reacts and then you say, oh, the media is dragging no us into... political minefield. There was a law before us. Yes. There was a challenge to a law before us. Yes. We were seeking the government's response to the challenge. We were reading stories and watching stories on uh, the television about people attacking each other. Uh, Forces attacking each other, people uh, jumping onto the uh, red fort uh, be, uh, on, the, on the Independence Day, I think. And Republic so, Day. So, Republic Day. So many violent instances, I had stated to the other side, I stated to the government, why don't you consider uh, doing this? Uh, why don't you consider withholding the laws? Because look at the consequence. There is a law on one side and there is a large-scale violence on the other side. What is, what is important right now? And there was no response. So I consulted my colleagues and we were all of the unanimous opinion that this should be stayed. What's, the, what's political about it? Okay. Uh, there was no election in the offing. And anyway, we have nothing to do with elections. And you're very clear at no stage has the judicial process been influenced, therefore, by the executive during yes. your tenure. Yes. Okay. The tangle between the executive and judiciary, sir, over appointments. 
you were chief justice for almost 18 months and during that period not a single supreme court judge was appointed yes because the collegium system could not arrive at a consensus no it is not because of the collegium system it is because as a collegium we were unable to arrive at a consensus it is not because of the system it is because we failed as a collegium to arrive at a consensus about the names because a particular or, or in some cases about the order in which there should be an elevation because there was a particular judge in your collegium who insisted that justice akhil qureshi be up elevated to the supreme court the government akhil, didn't want his name akhil qureshi no. was one of the judges who was not appointed there were many who were not appointed that's and right they were all appointed afterwards uh, but for 18 months we did not have a single appointment to yes, the supreme court yes so what does that suggest that there, there, there are there have been periods when you and you haven't had elevation for 2 years you had haven't had elevation for longer what is so uh, extraordinary about this we couldn't arrive at a consensus it can happen in a human institution do you believe therefore that there yes. is a need to relook at the system as it exists why should judges three five brother uh, sister judges sit together and decide on who will be a uh, fellow judge uh, who will be their fellow judges should the executive have a greater say as the executive seems to want the law minister right. seems to be running a campaign calling for a review of the collegium yeah, yeah. system let's, let's not go by the government of the day the gov the law minister of the day or the chief justice at the collegium of the day i'll tell you what my perspective is sir my perspective is that under the constitution of india there are three organs of government the executive the legislative and the judiciary they are separated in their functions and powers they are not separated in their purpose and objective the objective all of all three has to be the common objective set out in the constitution in the preamble i consider it perfectly legitimate that the executive ye naya maintenance head indeed se hire kiya tha नहीं सर वो मेरे पड़ोसी का भाई अगली बार इंडीट से हायर करना इंडीट सर हैज ए वाइटल इंटरेस्ट इन हु इज गोइंग टू बी अ जज अपार्ट फ्रॉम द फैक्ट दैट दे आर द एग्जीक्यूटिव एंड वन ऑफ द ऑर्गन ऑफ गवर्नमेंट दे आर ऑल्सो the largest litigant in any court now the problem is not that they have an interest in it the problem is how to give effect to that interest earlier it was only the chief justice of india who decided it along with the government sometimes the uh, prime minister the executive uh, the law minister then came the the two judges case it was widened the chief justice of india's power was shared with the collegium power and responsibility it was also you uh, brought in more fresh uh, views on the same elevation then came uh, the, the parliamentary law nja uh, national judicial ngc that uh, provided a wide representation to all kinds of opinions including to social workers eminent people the supreme court did not agree with it and uh, they struck down that law they also struck down the constitutional amendment yes. on the ground that the independence of the judiciary expressed through the appointment of judges is a part of the basic structure so uh, there was no say to the executive formally and that is as it is at the moment now you support that what? you believe that the executive should have no say no, in the appointment no i don't support it i started by saying that they have a vital interest in the should in, they have a veto power no so they shouldn't have a veto power the primacy of opinion must be that of the judiciary the reason is we know what is the 
caliber the merit and the suitability of the uh, judges who are to be elevated. We have seen them right from the days they were lawyers. We have uh, heard appeals against their judgments. We know how they think. We, we, are, the, we are best positioned to uh, uh, see which judge is meritorious. But the, those judges of the superior court, we are only talking of superior yes. courts, because in the 70% uh, of the judiciary, the public service commissions appoint them, which includes yes. the government. Yes. We are only talking of high court and supreme court. These courts, uh, these judges have to take an oath of office. That oath of office says that I shall uphold the sovereignty and integrity of India, that I shall uphold the constitution and the laws and uh, other things. Yes. It is important that a judge can do that as a judge. And on these aspects, it is often the executive's opinion which is vital. For instance, when the Intelligence Bureau reports to us, uh, things like uh, what is the what are the activities of this judge? Now you imagine a situation, a gross case, where one of the candidates is of the opinion that India should not be a sovereign entity like it is. There should be a separate state somewhere. Separate means mm -hmm. outside India. The executive is in the best position to tell the court that this is not a suitable candidate, the collegium. So the executive's opinion is important. With or without the NJC, I have full respect for the judgment of the Supreme Court, I am saying that consultation with the executive can be made by the Chief Justice of India and the collegium. Their views taken, but I believe the primacy must remain with the Chief Justice or the collegium. Okay, I think you've been pretty clear, categorical in that sense now about that. Consultation, but the final say must remain yes. with the collegium is what you're telling me. And okay. consultation, I do not mean concurrence. Okay, point taken. So we have very limited time left, but I'm sure. going to ask you some more. Let's lighten the mood. The most difficult case in your career. Huh. It's a case I didn't decide, but I'll tell you some... I mean, if you... There was a laborer who was charged with uh, rape and murder of a young girl. Yes. And she, uh, and that chap had been convicted. When the appeal was pending, the investigating officer committed suicide, saying that uh, I have uh, been forced Do you know why I like to work in DLF Cyber City Gurugram? Because it's amazing. My Friday night celebrations start just as I step outside of work. Because a world of experiences awaits right outside my office. My favorite restaurant, the city's best clubs, concerts and shows. Everything's just a step away. Every day here is a reason to rejoice. DLF Cyber City Gurugram. The future works here. To implicate this chap, mm -hmm. and he managed it successfully. The High Court agreed that his suicide note is true, and we were hearing an appeal. Obviously, he ought to have gone scot free. This is Lalit, the expert in criminal law. But I took the view that we should not acquit him till we prosecute these prosecution witnesses who had lied to their teeth. And there was a difference of opinion between my colleague and me. He said, no, no, we'll just let him go. I said, no, we, we must prosecute him. Fortunately, unfortunately, the bench changed. And I couldn't decide that case. But I have never been so foxed in a case as in this one. Because the... Uh, Suicide note was not part of the trial record. It's interesting you're saying that because your one judgment did create a lot of controversy. Where you, not judgment, but an observation you made in court where you suggested to a rape victim that she marry. I didn't. 
I didn't say that. This is uh, what was reported. I'll tell you what happened. I'll tell you what happened. That she marry her uh, alleged rapist. Uh, frankly, I want to tell you what happened because I haven't got a chance to tell anyone what happened. Please do. This, the boy and the girl had a love affair. Mm -hmm. They were related to each other distantly. They had a love affair and their parents on both sides objected because they were spending a lot of time together. Mm -hmm. So they, they told them, you get married. You can't carry on like this. They had an affair for seven, eight years. And they signed an agreement that we'll marry. Now that chap came in appeal. Uh, he applied for bail. When, and that woman then said that uh, we'll pro I'll prosecute you for rape because you've been, we've been having sex and you haven't married me. So that he, his bail was rejected. He came by way of a bail application before the Supreme Court. I told, the, I told him that what is this matter you've been living together and there is this agreement on record which you have signed to solve this family dispute. Right. And are you going to get married or not? That is what I asked. Okay. I just a minute. And then I rejected his bail application. Because uh, they said, no, no, we have not married. I haven't followed this agreement. I rejected his bail application. And these intelligent people in society wrote to me saying that you must review your orders. Means what? Grant him bail. Absurd thing. Uh, okay, uh, this is the danger of obiter dicta. Yeah. Uh, making headlines. No, uh, it, huh? it, but but my, my final, final question. Yeah is uh, there was a nice picture of you on a Harley Davidson. <laughs> uh, we haven't seen too many CJIs on a Harley Davidson. You're a mobile fan. We didn't know it till then. Uh, any regrets about being posing there? In, uh, I wasn't posing. <laughs> they just, I, somebody got that Harley Davidson. I sat on it. And there was somebody who had nothing to do with anything who took a picture and sent it to her lawyer husband. Right. And that is how it went around. I didn't ride it. I only sat on it. Though I would have liked to ride it, I will tell you that. <laughs> it was COVID times, a lot of, uh, tell you not the rest. You know, but since, frankly, since you I became very popular with the younger crowd. You did. <laughs> and, and you've also become very popular among judges because during COVID times, you brought in uh, online technology to encourage more and more people to appear before court. It's now hybrid. And I think it's made a huge difference to the courts. And that will be one of your many abiding legacies, Justice Bobde. But thank you so much thank you. for joining us and giving us your perspective. Appreciate Justice Bobde there taking those questions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, as thank you raise so a warm applause uh, for Justice Bobde, may I please call upon Mr. Virendra Kumar Kasliwal to come up on stage. Uh, he's the chief financial sir, controller. Sir, sir, sir. sir, just. Just two minutes, Somebody sir, to, to come up on stage and uh, present a small token of our appreciation to Justice Bobde. It's not a Harley Davidson, don't worry. <laughs> you have one? Wow. Does trading on a stock market app feel like going through an obstacle course? Well, we have simplified things with the new Trade Light app. Now do everything in two taps. Buy, sell, track, chart and more in seconds. Buy and sell directly from watch list. Buy and sell directly from charts. Keep track and jump on opportunities in two taps. Chart like a pro in two taps. Save and recall charting layouts with ease. Quick and easy order placement. Instant access to trading reports. Multiple segments. Download the app now. Thank you so much, sir. Okay, Thank that's, you, sir. That's not it. Uh, So Rajdeep continues with our next session. As he said, we have uh, two former Chief Justices and the current there. So the next session, over to you, Rajdeep.
Our second Chief Justice is another very distinguished occupant of the post who served as Chief Justice for just 74 days last year, but whose tenure is marked by truly some remarkable achievements. Most notably, the manner in which more than 16,000 cases were listed and almost 4,000 of them were cleared within the first 12 days of his tenure as CJI. And constitution benches were set up to dispose of key pending cases of constitutional importance. Please welcome Justice Yu Yu Lalit. Firstly, Justice Lalit, the manner in which you attempted to clear that judicial pile, that pile up in the Apex Court, was that a mission that you set yourself when you became Chief Justice? You knew you were Chief Justice for less than three months, but quite remarkably from day one, you really cracked the whip. It was not a mission, but it was something like a concerted action on part of everyone who was on the bench. The day I took over, same day we had a full court meeting and I placed before the, all the judges the statistics that there are about say 55 death sentence matters which are pending and under the regime that the Supreme Court has accepted, a death sentence matter has to come before a bench of three judges, which means that one must have sufficient number of three judge bench combinations. If you have just one or two combinations the judges get sort of, you know, it starts weighing on their conscience that how many death sentence matter am I supposed to hear? So I said, we must have at least six three judge combinations so that we can divide the work amongst the benches. We were to start with, we were 30 judges. So I also told the, all my colleague judges that divide 30 number by five and we can possibly have six constitution benches. All of us will be part of the benches. So what I did was six three judge combinations, which means 18, six two judge combinations, which means 12. Every time, you know, just add A on one side and B on the other and you have a constitution bench. So this is how we started. Then the second part which I told the judges was that there were referred matters to three judges combination which were pending consideration. What happens is, on a question of law, if a matter is referred to a bench of three judges, there is a domino effect that there are a number of other matters which are waiting for the decision in that matter. So therefore, if you decide one matter, logically you are actually deciding host of the other matters. So therefore, it is in this situation that we devised a way, and that's how we started. And I must thank every colleague of mine that everyone rose to the occasion and we started disposing of matters. But it's, it's had a huge effect. I can tell you that a lot of lawyers have truly appreciated it. Those who cover the courts have appreciated what you did. But, you know, I'll give you an example. Number of cases that were pending for a long time. The Siddiq Kappan case. A journalist is arrested under UAPA in 2020, October. The bench headed by you grants him bail in August 2022. And this comes at a time when a number of lower courts in this country are reversing the basic principle of law, bail not jail. They're instead saying, you know, not granting bail. You can go to Shah Rukh Khan's son's case in a lower court or a number of other le uh, less high profile cases. Is that a worry for you? That, you know, as someone who's an expert on criminal law, that a number of judges, especially in the lower courts, are not granting bail in cases where bail should have been given as a co a, a, in the normal courts? See, it depends upon the perspective of an individual. Some of the trial court judges, perhaps, they think that the case is not made out for grant of bail. Add to it one more dimension. Many of the statutory provisions make it difficult to grant bail. So therefore, there is an embargo under the statutory provision, say, for instance, NDPS law, the bail is, cannot be granted so easily. So therefore, a satisfaction first has to be entertained, has to be recorded by the judge that very well, you know, in my view, the man is not guilty of the offense with which he is charged. And then only the process of bail consideration then happens. So most of these occasions where the trial court or the judges in the first court do not grant bail may be because, number one, that the matter is still sort of, you know, pending investigation. So therefore, 
On most of the occasions, the investigating machinery comes up before the court and says that we are still in the process of investigating. So therefore, the court has to make up mind whether on the basis of material cases made out or not, or should I wait for some more material? It may be that way. But, but do you think there needs to be a review of the process, that the Supreme Court needs to send out perhaps, the Chief Justice Office needs to send out perhaps a clearer message? Look at the way PMLA, sir, the Prevention of Money Laundering Act has now, you know, and, and it's based now on a Supreme Court judgment, virtually giving police powers of a kind to the enforcement directorate that are draconian. Because it essentially means you are guilty and you will have to prove innocence. Enforcement directorate can come into my house under PMLA, arrest me, and I will struggle to get bail for months on end, even if I may be innocent. You are right. It may happen in an individual case. But if you see the, the judgment of the Supreme Court, which was rendered by a bench of three judges, of course, the review is pending on that issue. But this very point was urged before the court, and the court did not consider it appropriate to rule on that to say, and actually said that PMLA definitely hinges on one part, which is that the bail provisions, as I mentioned in the earlier, earlier just about five minutes back, some of these statutory provisions make it difficult to grant bail, and PMLA is one of them. Should they be reviewed? Then the validity of the legislation has to be challenged, number one. Number two, it is a parliamentary legislation. So therefore, it is our legislators who have come out with this particular law. Unless and until that legislation is validly challenged before the court, the court is bound to proceed on the basis of that. Justice Lalit, let me come to where, in a way, string uh, uh, the thread that I began with Justice Bobney. How independent are our courts? Has the apex court in this country turned into what scholars like Gautam Bhatia have suggested, an executive court? mindful of being in line with whatever the political executive really wants. Basically, for all the obiter dicta that often we hear from judges, all the fire and brimstone against the government, when it comes to the judgments, they fall in line with what the political executive wants. This is what a legal scholars suggest is the making of an executive court. I do not subscribe to that view at all. According to me, all the courts, are quite independent, and you will actually see it in the process. Say, for instance, two matters which came before me, one was Siddiq Kappan, the other was Tista Settlewad. Both of them were released on bail. Another matter which came before me, Vinod Dua, he was also granted solace relief in the matter. Third one, again, somebody from Varavara Rao, again, we granted him relief. It's not as if. Please, and what happens is we, we, are, we jump in immediately to make a generalized statement. It is not so. The courts are completely independent, and this kind of theory which Justice Bobde actually referred to, that it is very, very difficult for the judges and very easy for somebody from outside to criticize that. You know, as media persons, we can... Of course, uh, it, yes. it, it, you are entitled to. It, yes. It's our job to, in a way, yes. question. You say criticize, but the sealed envelope. You know, important cases, the judges say, please give it to us in a sealed envelope. We don't know what's in the sealed envelope. Uh, no, and I'll, that results I'll, in a lack of transparency. I'll tell you, this all started in that Vineet Narayan case, That's which right. was Jain Diary case, correct? At that juncture, the Supreme Court was interfering or was considering the matter and... At that juncture, the investigation was still on. It was not clear whether the material which the investigator had collected, was it worthy, was it sufficient? But at the same time, the court just wanted to consider that the issue was considered or looked into by the investigators. So therefore, sealed envelope was entertained. The court did not pass any order. All that it said is that if according to you, Mr. Investigator, there is a case made out, Proceed further. That's it. You know, it's interesting you mentioned just now, a little while ago, the Tista Settlement case. Because I recall, sir, and let me be honest today, when you became Chief Justice, uh, there was media comment again that Justice Lalit, I think when you became a judge, actually, that you had been Amit Shah's counsel in the Sorabuddin case, and that will Justice Lalit therefore be truly independent? You showed through your judgments that you were independent, and kudos to you for that. But there was this sense that, will, did that ever weigh on your mind that will 
the media commentary that plays out that here is the home minister's former counsel in the Sorabuddin case, now the chief justice. Am I, were you under extra pressure at any stage? Not at all. See, as a lawyer, I represented something like 18 chief ministers in various matters, including SM Krishna, who was from Congress, Sukram, who was from Congress, some of the three chief ministers from Maharashtra who were from Congress, Yadiyurappa, who was BJP, <laughs> then Jailalita, who was again in the opposition. So I have represented number of them. I have not met any one of them. So therefore, it was only pure and simple professional assignment. To me, it was like appearing in any matter, whether it was ABC, XYZ, or that politician. It makes no difference. That's wonderful to hear, sir, because I think it's important to recognize perhaps that sometimes the media criticism, as you said, uh, is based around speculation. But let's come for a moment to judicial pressure. During your term, the one case where you found yourself in a bit of a spot, you listed a case on a Saturday on an appeal filed by the Maharashtra government challenging the acquittal of a DU professor, G.N. Sai Baba, accused of Maoist links. Many of Many saw this as unusual, especially as Justice Chandrachud on the Friday had orally expressed a view against any urgent listing. Next morning, listing takes place, a bench sits and the acquittal is suspended. And many believe that this was done under pressure. I have already responded to this line of question in one of the interviews. And that was by perhaps I think uh, Srinivas and Jain. That's right, after Correct? you uh, yes, demitted office. Right. I'll tell you, in case now that you have repeated the question, then I must answer it completely. See, it was a Friday, and that was the last working day for Justice Hemant Gupta. So it was, he was demitting office, and on the last day, the custom is that the retiring judge sits in with the Chief Justice. So he was sitting with me. And the last day, the number of matters which are listed before such a bench are very, very less. So we rose for the day around 1 o'clock. The matter was mentioned in court number two because the chief's court was not sitting. So it was mentioned before the bench presided over by Justice Chandrachud. Justice Chandrachud, naturally, because when you are mentioning, the papers are not before you. So the matter was mentioned by the learned solicitor general. And his first reaction was that in case the bail is the issue, then why should we list it tomorrow? Correct. But finally, the Solicitor General perhaps was able to convince him. So therefore, the order which was passed had three paragraphs. Number one, saying that the apprehension is expressed by Mr. Solicitor General that in case the matter is not heard immediately, the person may be released on, released immediately. Yes. Number two, we therefore allow him to make a mention before the so, so that to get the matter listed next day. Taxbuddy.com per login kare and sign up with their tax planner. Now, it was possible for the court to list the matter next week because the normal mentioning was there. But the court was definitely convinced that if we list the matter sometime next week, that is Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, perhaps the urgency which has been canvassed will completely get nullified and therefore the chance had to be given that in case the matter can be listed on Saturday. Now the other thing is such kind of urgent listings the court number two is not entitled to do. Going by the master of roster it is only the chief who can do it. So therefore the order was actually put in a very very what we say is the, is the format of deference that we give liberty so and so so and so to make a mention. But the intent of the order is that definitely you consider the matter. So therefore, at about say 4 o'clock when the matter was brought before me, the order, the paper book again was not before me. Secondly, the man who brings before me the order was not aware as to what oral observations were made by the court while the mentioning was on. So I was to go to the, to the to the hall where the final felicitation of Justice Gupta was to be undertaken. So as we enter, the first person that I wish to contact is Justice Chandrachod himself. 
I approach him and say that now that you have actually come out with this order, will you be part of the special bench to be constituted tomorrow? He had certain reservations because he had given some kind of you know commitments to somebody. So therefore, he said it won't be possible. The major part of the day, I have given some commitments. So therefore, I turned to the next because it was right there. All the judges were there. So three judges, Justice Rastogi, Justice Gawai, and Justice Surekant, I approached them. They again say that we have some other commitments. The fourth judge that I approach is Justice Ravindra Bhatt. He said, sir, I have actually called the Steno to complete a judgment, so therefore I have some commitment on that front. But in case you don't get anybody, I'm willing. So as a default option. So the next person that I contact, is Justice Bela Trivedi. She says yes. Then the man next who I bump into is Justice M.R. Shah. I again put the same question to him. He said yes. So this is how the bench got constituted. OK. I'm glad now, you gave. No, no. Now just listen to that. None of those persons, neither M.R. Shah, nor Bela Trivedi, nor me, are aware of the intricacies of the matter. The intricacies of the matter are actually before the bench, which had heard the mentioning. None of us were even aware of that. We simply listed the matter next day. Why? In deference to what the order had said. Okay. It's interesting that you've given that backstory to clear the air. Again, it's part, as I said, therefore, the media will have their own commentary, which carries on. And I will come to that to the media pressures on a, on a judge. But very quickly, sir, collegium system. Do you approve of what the law minister has been saying publicly calling for a review of the system? Do you believe that the executive deserves a greater say or some would even say a, a return to the NJAC, uh, the National Judicial Appointments Committee? Do we need a return to that? See, as judges, we take oath that we will abide by the constitution as by law established. Wasn't it the judgment of the five judges which said that NJAC is not the correct law? So are we supposed to observe and go by the constitution as by law established or have a different modality? We had to observe purely by the collegium system. See, in a polity, if you have another system, if you have another regime in contemplation, let that regime be put in place in a manner known to law. The moment it is put in place, the judges will be bound to observe that. As of now, if you ask me my personal view, then according to me, the collegium system is the ideal system. Is the ideal system? Absolutely. You don't believe it leads to aberrations, it leads to sort of lack See, of, every, there is an opacity to it, there is a, a sense that the judiciary becomes a bit of a cabal that decides on its own who will be the fellow judges? See, I'll tell you, now, this collegium which was headed by Justice Ramana, where I was judge number two in the court, we had Justice Kanvilkar as number three, and three of us, we made recommendations which were accepted by the government and about 255 persons were appointed. At the same time, we did not accept the matters which were coming through the Collegium of the High Court. And about 70 or 80 names we rejected. 40 odd names are still under consideration by the government. So therefore, look at the kind of, uh, you know, the statistics themselves show that we at the apex level, we don't accept everything which comes through the Collegium of the High Court. Now, how is the matter actually coming through the Collegium? See, you require judges at every level. The whole system is geared to have the best possible talent. Now, under the Constitution, the lower judiciary or the district judiciary is completely under the control of the High Court. Appointments, posting, promotion, transfers, everything is done by the High Court. The executive has no say. It is through these courts that one third of the strength of the High Court is actually forming. So you have those persons whose entire profile is seen by the High Court at every juncture. Not just one or two persons, but repeatedly as an institution. Similarly, the advocates who practice before the High Court they, the judges who form the body, they see their performance every day. So who are actually supposed to be better positioned to see the merit or the talent? Somebody sitting as an executive here or somebody who is actually seeing the grassroot level performance, say in Kochi or in Manipur or in Andhra or in say Ahmedabad. 
No, it then is the let High me, Court alone. So, so let me quote again Dushyant Dave, uh, a senior Supreme Court advocate. We have a large number of judges who are highly questionable. They either lack the expertise or the knowledge and most of all the commitment. I know of judges who haven't delivered a single good judgment. I don't know about Mr. Dushyant Dave's sort of, you know, this particular statement and why he made that statement. But it is for him to justify that. I can't actually have a counter justification. Correct? According to me, see, that is exactly why. When a man is made judge of the High Court, you see the performance. When we select a man, Justice Bobde, anybody who has been part of the Collegium, we see the judgments, we see the kind of performance which he has over a period of time has actually come out with. It is after that that five judges of the Supreme Court then consider whether a man is worthy or not. At the same time, they are also guided by the advice given by what we call the consulting judges. So in the process, there are not just five who are collegium judges, but there are other consulting judges as well. At the same time, the version coming from the executive, the executive, as Justice Bobde said, that perhaps it may have something to say about the profile of the man. It may be that there may be some kind of complaint against him. There may be something, some dark corner somewhere in the persona, which perhaps as, as judge in the collegium, we are not aware of. So therefore, that part of the consultation through IB reports to everything is also placed before the court. It is after that that the process, that the decision is taken. Okay, you know, because there are interesting cases like that of Justice, uh, uh, of, of Senior Advocate Saurabh Kirpal, which has been held up and, and it's, you know, result is, is his sex reason for it. All of this is speculated. See, again, now just consider this. The Collegium did not falter on Saurabh Kirpal's case. Collegium did make a recommendation. Collegium did reiterate. So how do we say collegium system is bad? It is the fault lies somewhere else, if at all. Okay. I want to ask you this uh, in conclusion. Uh, you quite wonderfully, after you've retired, have gracefully gone to teach OP Jindal University, Mumbai, IIT, your teaching constitutional law. Honest answer. Should former CJIs or judges after retirement take any government sinecure without a cooling off period? We've just had a Supreme Court fellow colleague of yours becoming a governor of a state. We've had a Supreme Court Chief Justice becoming a nominated member of the Rajya Sabha. Do you believe this is a healthy practice? It all depends upon the individual. See, some individuals may, may find nothing objectionable. Person like me would rather say that very well, let me try something else in another quarter. Correct. I have been a lawyer. I have been a judge. Let me be a professor now. Yes. You know, I think those cheers really say it all, that there is a problem if you don't have a cooling off period. So very quickly, your most difficult case. Acha, wo naya forklift operator in DEET se hire kiya? Mere chacha ke ladke ko hire kiya, madam. Baut hoshi hai. Agli baar in DEET se hire karna. In DEET. Not in terms of any quality or any kind of problem which it fa posed, but sheer bulk of the matter, that was 2G. The kind of you know, paperwork which ran into lakhs and lakhs of pages, to be controlling that, to be sort of you know, in the midst of everything where there were at least, by the time we finished, more than 150 witnesses were examined. So much of documentation. So sheer bulk, that was the only thing. You know, what's the most satisfying thing about being a judge? You were a very successful lawyer. What, what was uh, most satisfying of being a judge? You must have taken a huge cut in salary to become a judge. The, all that is something completely a personal decision, correct, yes. See, I, I always felt that I have been part of this institution uh, before I took that plunge. I had put in about 32 years in the practice as a lawyer. I have earned some name, some fame, some money, some stature. It is only through that profession which is the law profession. So there is some way to give back to the society and that is where I accepted judgeship. 
another feature or another form in which I wish to give it back to the society is teach the law students. That's it. Three words, three words to describe the three words to describe the state of the Supreme Court today. Fantastic court, yet tremendous area for improvement. Okay, I think you've left enough. You've given us a teaser perhaps yes. for another interview where we'll discuss perhaps those areas of improvement. But Justice Lalit, uh, it's been a pleasure having you here today. It, the pleasure has been mine. Sir. And uh, speaking so openly and freely, I think moment people demit office, some of that burden goes away and you can speak even more freely. And I'm sure that's as true of you as many others. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you, Justice. Thank you, you, Lalit. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Justice Yu Yu Lalit as I call upon Nitin Seth, Vice Chairman Tops, to come up on stage and present a very small token of our appreciation to Justice Lalit. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together. Raise a warm applause for Justice Yu Yu Lalit. Ladies and gentlemen, just want to give you a heads up. Uh, the photo exhibit that I was telling you about right outside at the Shah Jahan Hall, where uh, India Today's uh, AI team has completely reimagined some of our iconic covers, is only going to be there for just about an hour or two more. So do go out, step out, take a look, because we're going to clear the hall for the Prime Minister's security. He is our keynote speaker this evening. The area will need to be sanitized, so do go ahead and uh, if you haven't till now, and I recommend it highly, you must go and do it. Also, want to reiterate uh, that whatever you've seen, uh, yesterday, today, where thought leaders from all walks of life coming in together, sharing their vision of the India moment, all of that, the highlights of it will be re-encapsulated in our next edition of the India Today magazine. All right, we're ready to go into our next session for this afternoon. Do settle down. Those uh, crowding the aisles, please uh, just come in, settle down. All right, let's get into our next session this afternoon. Soul Eclipse, why our children are self-harming, how to fix it, insights on the teenage depression epidemic in India. We've put together a short film on teenage depression I'd like you to see it before we cut across to our session's moderator. Do you know why I like to work in DLF Cyber City Gurugram? The future arrives faster here and so do I. I don't know about other roads, but the one I take to work doesn't have bumper to bumper traffic or loud horn music. This road is wide open for me. It's my expressway to the future. DLF Cyber City Gurugram. The future works here.
and depression they just don't go together right i was around 16 years old day after day i would wake up feeling shattered i think one of my closest friends struggled with mental health i think she was just 12 or 13 it took me more than 6 months of suffering three or four suicidal attempts and many 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 notices from university of absence to convince my parents that i need medical attention a lot of my friends have considered or have actually self harm in my circle of friends i've encountered a lot of cases of depression and anxiety really understand what depression is they think that you have to be of a certain age to be depressed bullying would be one of the biggest reasons for depression body shaming people making fun of people for their uh, sexuality there's this like need to please on social media being very conscious of what you're posting like wanting to edit every picture be it in a uh, family or in school people are unconsciously pressure boys to be a certain way first would definitely be like family issues my parents they didn't handle their divorce as well as they should have and i feel like that's the case with a lot of people and they involve their child too much uh, way more than they should i think bullying is a big one a lot of people still feel like they can't confide in their parents there's a big divide between people of other sexualities and people who are, are considered to be conventional everything is so competitive anything below like 99.99% uh feels like a failure body is a very big one skinny is the, yeah, like a definitely. constant one uh then they snatched which is having a really small waist, waist. yeah, yeah. <laughs> domestic violence obviously has to be on that list because uh once a child sees that it like traumatizes them for the rest of their lives 